complaint to nowadays is that ours is an age without heroes. All kinds of people uh, win fame, uh, but few of them earn our respect, let alone our awe. And yet, uh, ours is a civilization of great wealth and superb technology. Uh, we look forward to ever more amazing scientific advances that will prolong and enrich our lives. Uh, we don't seem to have any doubts about the historic stature of mankind. So why don't we produce any heroes? Some say that there's something the matter with us and our age. Others say there's nothing the matter with us at all. The problem is the whole idea of heroes. As to uh, former heroes, those giants of the past owed their historic status to the uh, greater ignorance and more widespread gullibility of their times. Uh, so do former heroes deserve their historic status or don't they? There's a problem about uh, assessing heroes. Um, we like our heroes to be supermen. So that even those of genuine heroic achievement are swiftly transformed from human beings into legends. The very first task in assessing a hero is to disentangle the man from the myth. Of no one is that more true than the man who's generally considered to be the greatest hero our own nation ever produced. Winston Churchill. The Churchill myth is immensely powerful because he's uh, judged to personify the unique characteristics of the British at their very best. The conventional account uh, of uh, Churchill uh, doesn't bother with any subtlety. Uh, this heroic leader and his heroic people were bonded together in a triumphant struggle against evil. This isn't just a national myth, it's THE national myth. It's comforted us for 50 years through the loss of empire and our status as a great power. Our former enemies and our former allies may have surpassed us economically, but we have a reason to feel superior to them. At a uh, crucial moment, in history. We stood alone in defense of human freedom. Not even our allies can claim that. Uh, either like the French, they broke and capitulated to Hitler, or like the Americans, they weren't even in the war at that vital stage. Britain stood alone in the breach, and this is what defines us and shows what the world owes us. There was no more enthusiastic plugger of this view of history than Churchill himself. After the war, he said uh, self-deprecatingly that it was the nation that had had the lion heart. He had merely done the roaring. But there's something the matter with this national myth. It isn't true. It's comforting but it's false. The supposed identification between Churchill and the people is largely imaginary. Churchill wasn't the average Briton, writ large. Both before the war and during the war, his uh, outlook and motivations was quite different from the British norm. That doesn't mean Churchill wasn't a hero. It means he wasn't, couldn't be, the kind of hero the myth says he was. Winston Churchill was already 56 years old when early in 1931 he stormed out of the Tory shadow cabinet because it was prepared to consider dominion status for India. Churchill was an imperialist diehard of uh, the most uh, unsubtle, rigid 
an authoritarian kind. That was wholly in character uh, because Churchill believed that he was right about everything and that what he wanted ought to be done. Whatever anybody else said, whatever the consequences of it uh, might be, and whoever suffered. He'd had an appalling childhood, neglected by his mother and bullied by his tyrannical father, so that he was a hopeless failure at Harrow. He'd achieved self-worth, a feeling of it, uh, by blotting out criticism and uh, by firmly proclaiming uh, the excellence of his judgment. Churchill's stance on India was a tragedy for him. It meant he spent a whole decade on the back benches, and worse than that, it tainted his views on nearly every other subject because of the general view that he was an old-fashioned, blimpish reactionary. If Churchill had died in the 1930s, and he thought he would die young, history would not have returned a favorable verdict on him. Uh, he certainly wasn't a political hero. He'd done nothing memorable. He was famous, uh, but uh, fame's one thing. Uh, he was also isolated and distrusted. And then, as the years drifted away from him, he was nearly 65 at the outbreak of war. Suddenly, he put his energies into an unpopular cause that redeemed everything. He warned the House of Commons and the British people about the vaulting, warlike ambitions of the German Führer Adolf Hitler. Now, Churchill wasn't necessarily mortally opposed to dictators. He uh, admired Mussolini uh, for quite a long time. Uh, Churchill believed in democracy, but he was always inclined to think democracy was best left to English-speaking peoples and was rather less suitable uh, for Indians and Italians. Nor was Churchill particularly shocked by aggression. He made no protest about the Japanese attack on Manchuria in 1931. But what Churchill did care about most passionately was British interests. Anyone or anything that was hostile to British interests, he opposed with all his heart and soul. Churchill's warnings on Hitler were ignored. It's often said these days that that's uh, because of the stupidity of Stanley Baldwin and Neville Chamberlain. Not a bit of it. Churchill wasn't listened to because the British people wanted peace at almost any price. Churchill was attacked in much of the press as a warmonger. There weren't more than two or three MPs who genuinely supported him. And in the intimacy of the smoking room of the House of Commons, Tory MPs tore his reputation to pieces. Uh, he'd always been disloyal, they said. And he was a drunkard, a mere adventurer. Churchill's great crime was to have spotted Hitler's real intentions and his total lack of scruple before the House of Commons or indeed uh, the British people. Uh, that's what uh, really was held against him. Uh, he called Hitler uh, a demon figure sprung from the abyss. But uh, people flinched to hear such uh, unwelcome news. It's very easy to forget these days how wildly popular the policy of appeasing Hitler was. When Chamberlain came back from Munich in September 1938 with peace in our time, he was given an uncritical national ovation. He appeared on the uh, balcony at Buckingham Palace with the King and Queen to the delirious cheers of a massive crowd. Churchill said that Munich was a total and unmitigated defeat. 
and he was hated for saying so. Nothing is more unpopular in politics than being right too soon. But when the war came, Chamberlain had to make Churchill First Lord of the Admiralty. Uh, his appeasement strategy had gone grotesquely wrong. And there had to be somebody in the cabinet who'd been right about Hitler. But the war went very badly. And after the defeat in Norway, Chamberlain found his support ebbing away. On the day the Germans invaded the Low Countries, Chamberlain resigned and Churchill became Prime Minister. Most Tory MPs would have much preferred Lord Halifax, but he very sensibly ruled himself out. And then when Chamberlain left the new Churchill coalition because he was dying of cancer, Churchill became leader of the Conservative Party. He disliked and despised most people in the party, but he needed the power base. Um, Churchill's uh, view of the 20th century party politics uh, was very much that of what he was at heart, an 18th century Whig aristocrat. He popped in and out of the Conservative and Liberal parties as it uh, suited him. Uh, he didn't let parties uh, use him. Uh, he used them. And he had every intention, as wartime Prime Minister, of operating as an elected dictator. Uh, he knew he was right uh, about uh, all important matters, by which he meant all matters on which he held an opinion. And the strongest of all his opinions was that Adolf Hitler had got to be smashed in an all-out total war. But uh, when Churchill became Prime Minister in May 1940, uh, a lot of the British elite and a lot of the British people weren't prepared uh, for a life or death struggle. The elite had been rather impressed by Hitler's implicit offer to Britain before the war. Hitler said he admired Britain and the British Empire, which he wished to see preserved. The only thing he didn't like about Britain was that it wouldn't give him a free hand in Europe. And he couldn't understand why. Surely it made sense for Germany to dominate the continent whilst Britain ruled the high seas and reaped the profits of empire. After the collapse of France and the British escape at Dunkirk, fresh word arrived of Hitler's attitude. Uh, the Fuhrer uh, couldn't understand the idiotic decision to give a guarantee to Poland and go to war against Germany. But he was prepared to overlook that mistake. Britain could have peace if she wanted it. And a lot of people did want it. Few of Churchill's senior colleagues had any fire in their bellies. Now let's be clear. These men weren't contemptible and they weren't cowards. They didn't think Hitler could be beaten and they dreaded the cost of fighting him, not only in lives, but because they rightly supposed that it would strip Britain of all her assets. They thought there was a very good reason for preferring peace to war. The British people in general knew very little about all these matters, but there too there was a longing for peace. Chamberlain's policy had been very popular. Uh, when he said, speaking of the struggle between the Czechs and the Sudeten Germans, uh, that this was a quarrel in a faraway country about whose people we know nothing, one can deplore his insularity and lack of vision. But he spoke for the overwhelming majority. Uh, and now we'd got a war, but most people hadn't wanted it. And why should they? Wars are terrible things. Plenty of people uh, thought about the First World War. Were we going to get these same sort of appalling casualties again? And anyway, 
we seem to be losing this war. The general feeling was that old Churchill knew about wars. That's uh, why he got the job. Let's hear what he had to say. And if Churchill had offered some peaceful way out of this problem, he would have carried the whole country with him. Nothing, of course, was further from his mind. Uh, he did not want peace with the Nazis, nor did he want a half-hearted war. Wars are won by resources, but not if the country concerned lacks the will to win. Churchill was determined that the British should have the will to win and should expect to win. He knew, and he was never wrong, that the British were essentially heroic. It's true that a few doubts had crept in, uh, but he'd soon settle them. Uh, his world view depended upon the British being heroes. So heroes they must be. He settled the problems in the cabinet by blandishments, a judicious uh, dispersal of the worst cases to other jobs, and by working the junior ministers up into a fever pitch of bellicosity. So that got rid of defeatism in the government. Now he had to persuade the British people that the war was worth fighting. He didn't uh, do it by offering any soft options. He told the House of Commons that he had nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears and sweat. But it was his remarkable radio addresses uh, that did most to stiffen morale. His message was stark. We were fighting barbarism and we would never surrender to it. The survival of civilization depended upon our winning and so we must win. We owed it to humanity. And this was our finest hour. Uh, the hour for which all of our history had shaped us. I heard those broadcasts and uh, their impact was electrifying. It was impossible to listen to this growling, resolute man without sharing a little of his uh, pride and determination. I think the key to it all was that he thought so well of us it seemed shameful to disappoint him. So gone with the thoughts of a negotiated peace. Churchill thought we were heroes. He'd set us a task. Let's get on with it. That was the mood. It was his crowning achievement. He had persuaded a peaceful people to want to fight all out. And he had taken a tremendous gamble. Because we all know now how it all turned out, uh, people talk about Churchill's vision. He certainly had that. His pre-war attitude to Hitler shows that. But uh, uh, this wasn't vision. Churchill was extraordinarily lucky. He knew uh, that we couldn't beat Germany without allies, but he couldn't possibly have foreseen uh, that Hitler would violate the Nazi-Soviet pact and invade Russia. And who on earth would have supposed that the Japanese would be so foolhardy as to start a war with the Americans? Churchill didn't keep us in the war because of a rational evaluation of the prospects. It was his self-obsession, his belief that he was absolutely right, his will that mattered. He didn't do it because there were national consensus. There wasn't a national consensus. The national set consensus came about because his actions left the British people with no alternative. His monument is from the summer of 1940 to the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. Britain stayed in the war and the Allies arrived, the Russians and the Americans. The European war was essentially won on the Russian front, where the Germans were slowly ground down at the cost of 20 million Russian lives. But what about uh, Churchill's control of British? war strategy. Well, he wasn't a great strategist. He left the Asian empire undefended so that much of it uh, fell 
to the Japanese without effective resistance. A blow that, in a sense, Britain was standing has never recovered from. Towards the enemy, he had no pity. The merciless bombing of Dresden in 1945, when the war was practically won, uh, caused enormous civilian casualties for no military purpose whatsoever. Unless to cheer up Stalin, who always liked to think uh, that his allies were doing something. But in terms of Britain's military operations, Churchill was extremely cautious, an aspect of his leadership that's very seldom stressed. He kept casualties down. Uh, Britain uh, had stood alone and had withstood the German blitz. As if, it's as if he felt that uh, British heroism shouldn't be tested too far. So that, for instance, the Second Front was delayed until its success uh, was almost assured. Churchill must have pondered long and hard why he'd failed to persuade the nation to abandon appeasement in the 1930s. And it may well be that he'd come to realize that the majority of British people wanted a peaceful life and a better tomorrow. That would explain why he accepted the beverage report, which was really the institution of the welfare state. It otherwise seems a very odd thing for him to do. I think Churchill had come to think that the righteousness of the cause wasn't a sufficient incentive in a long war. The British had to feel uh, that their victory would mean a better life uh, for themselves and for their families. The war was, of course, won. Churchill's uh, post-war record wasn't memorable. Uh, he lost the general election of 1945 after a very unintelligent campaign. He was largely an absentee leader of the opposition. Didn't do much there. And uh, though I think it's true that the magic of his name probably helped the Tories to come back to power in 1951, his second premiership was a fiasco. On and on he went, despite having a severe stroke, uh, to no purpose. He had nothing to contribute. The aimless drift of British policy between 51 and his resignation in 55 possibly robbed us of the chance to secure a new national purpose, to replace the mission of empire. So what are we to make of this deeply flawed man who would uh, never have been Prime Minister in the first place except uh, for the war. Was he a hero? Well, I'm not blind to Churchill's faults and I reject the sanitized Churchill myth. But my principal objection to the myth is that it does him less than justice. He was a greater hero uh, than the myth allows because Churchill wasn't just a war leader. For a time, it was only his will and determination that kept us in the war. Yes, he was an anachronism. Yes, he was uh, selfish. Yes, he was capricious. Uh, yes, he arrogantly believed that he was right about everything and wouldn't take good advice, but he kept us in the war. If Britain had made peace in 1940, Hitler would have conquered all of Europe, including Russia. Churchill had taken a very great gamble, and as a hero should, I'm certain he would have made the supreme sacrifice himself, uh, if in fact uh, the gamble hadn't succeeded and persuaded a lot of other people to do the same thing. Of course, that runs clean counter to modern man's view uh, that peace is the highest of all good. So, can we justify that? Well, peace is indeed a wonderful thing. 
if you can have it on any sort of permanent basis and if the having of it is worthwhile. The idea of Britain having peace uh, while that chaotic figure, Hitler, rampaged through Europe, murdering, exterminating tens of millions of people, treating the rest as slaves. Uh, the idea that somehow this would have uh, given us some sort of stability, to my mind, is absurd. And suppose, as he well might, Hitler had got hold of nuclear weapons. How long would any shred uh, of British independence have lasted then? Peace is a wonderful prize to secure. But it has to be secured in a way that makes it meaningful. It was a German, Goloman, the son of Thomas Mann, who said that Winston Churchill gave the war meaning and moral greatness because Britain's stand ensured the survival of human rights. There can be no greater tribute and that's why Churchill was a hero. Pregnant horse proves a testing case for one of the vets in practice on BBC One in just a tick. Here on BBC Two, a village traces its roots back to the Iron Age. Meet the Ancestors is next.